tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. If darkness is what you're after, seek no more your searches through. You haven't found the darkness, traveler. The darkness has found you. Welcome to Season 3, Episode 22. I'm your host, Jason Hill, and I'm thrilled you could join me tonight. I hope you're ready for a big steaming heap of horror this night. And who better to lead us down that storied path of blood and bones than the master of the macabre, Jeff Sturtevant. When Jeff dips his ladle into the Book of Bob, only chunks of sheer, visceral, slightly garlicky terror comes out. Oh yes, no jokes here, folks. Just pure, uncut, Colombian-grade fear. Not a single, solitary quip to be found. And that's what you want, isn't it? That's why you keep coming back, right? Yes. Yes, yes, I know what you like. Well... Be sure to hold your breath, because you're about to be dipped in scariness. For context, I highly recommend revisiting Season 2, Episode 3, When You Wish Upon a Jar, as it provides backstory and key insights into the rich and colorful cast of characters that populate the Book of Bob. But beware, you'll find no levity nor jolly tomfoolery in those benighted pages. Only fear. Delicious. Succulent. Unrelenting. Fear. You're listening to the standard edition of this program. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy ad-free versions of this and all our other episodes, as well as hundreds of tales from our audio archives dating back to 2012, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today to get instant access from our friends at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Thank you for your support. Now, allow me to escort you to the place where the sun dies. The nightmares come to life, where those who seek the darkness need look no further. Welcome, listener, to the Horror Hill. You haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found... <coughs> <coughs> Ah. Mm. You. And now, without further ado, from author Jeff Sturdivant, I give you The Destroyer, Part One. Part 1 You know the reason they call it bowling, don't you? It's on account of the sound it makes when you roll the ball. Bowl. Get it? Now, Reverend usually knew what he were talking about to some extent. The sole proprietor of town general and a part-time pastor, he were hardly a convention scholar. But age had brought him wisdom, and considering the apt comparison to the noise it made when you were bowling, and the fact the game had nothing specific to do with bowls themselves, Bob supposed that may be the reason they called it bowling after all. I knew that, Bob said. See that, Reb said. 
Bob knowed it. You know the thing about Bobby, said Randy. He's one of them fellas seems to know a whole bunch of stuff. I says to him once, Bobby, you know the best thing about WD-40? And I'll be damned if he didn't outstrip me right there where I stood. He goes, you can dab it in your armpits for a little parfum. Well, I'll be, Rev said. And what was you going to tell him? For the life of me, Rev, I don't kindly remember. Sure I had something in mind, but I'll be damned if I know what now. I'll be, Rev said. Bob, you sure do know your stuff. Bob, fairly pleased with himself, diddled his nipple through the pocket of his three-button Henley. Reverend Randy and Bob made their way to aisle eight, sat in the plastic seats, and commenced to don their rental shoes. An eerie quiet came over the men as they composed themselves for competition. Randy, being the nephew of the alley's sole proprietor, Theodore Sims, figured Bolin were in his blood, and treated every detail of the game with an almost ceremonial reverence. Reverend, on the other hand, were fairly unorthodox in his approach. Well, he could hardly gig him on the rules for it. A purist might consider Reverend's bowling form an affront to traditionalism. Still, by the end of the night, you could hardly tell the two apart by looking at the scorecard. Old Bob were a different story. Having particularly thick digits as he did, there weren't a ball on the rack he could get his fingers into. Twice a week he perused the shells, and twice a week he ended up bowling open-handed. It occurred to Bob that if he had a natural talent at the game of bowling, he were yet to find out. Not once in his long and storied existence had Bob Mason bowled a ball the way you were supposed to. What'd they call bowling before that? Randy asked Rev. Was that? I mean, before they called it bowling, Randy said. Considering they named it after the sound it makes, that implies they'd have to have done it in the first to hear the sound of it. So, what did they call it before that? Before they knew what sound to name it to? Well, I'll be dipped, Bob said. Reverend regarded Randy with a look of veiled confusion. Somewhere out by the arcade machines, a flurry of teenage laughter arose and perished. Further down, a strike. A cheer. Well, figure they just called it Roland then, he said. Shit. I knew that, Bob said. See that? Bob knowed it. The men disbanded to select their weaponry. Randy, his own custom ball, polished smooth and slick and emblazoned with his name. The color is something between pump grease and viral snot. Two-inch offset right off the second hole like a weird orange mole. A beauty. It were downright decadency for a man to have his own custom ball, Bob thought. It weren't Randy's fault he were born into a bowling family and endowed with certain privileges there too. But he sure as hell hadn't earned those privileges either, had he? Somewhat resentfully, Bob perused the racks, turning the balls with one hand to see where there were any new ones with holes big enough to fit him and absently flicking his nipple with the other. Reverend selected his usual neon pink five-pounder. It was drilled for a child, but on account of the man's unorthodox technique, the holes didn't matter much. Bob, seeing he had to make do yet again, grabbed a plain black 16-pounder with a scar on it like an axe wound. The usual fare for such occasions. Cradling the inferior ball like something freshly dead, it occurred to Bob he were disadvantaged in this respect. His father always told him he'd been born with a couple of extra chroma bones. He were never sure exactly where said bones were supposed to be, but now that he reckoned it, they must certainly be in his fingers. Thinking more still, it were clear Bob's affliction were a certified birth effect, and this particular establishment were plum unaccommodating to patrons with such birth effects. The notion seemed to prompt in Bob a righteous sense of social justice. Bob resolved at that moment that he'd be dipped in shit before he suffered another indignity at the hands of this ill-reputed alley. Enervated, 
He set his sights on the front counter with all the shoes behind it, kind of puffing up his chest and feeling righteous. He stuck out his mustache, hooked his thumbs in his overall straps, and started over. The song on the sound system was Girl School by Brittany Fox, and it lent him a kind of unfettered swagger he knew could not be easily denied. I'll be dipped, said Bob. He approached the shoe counter. The girl behind it were particularly too little and dainty to see until he got right up to it and looked down at her. There she were, spritzing the shoes with anti-deodorant spray, trying to match them up in pairs and stow them in their corresponding cubbies. She were presently kneeled down to put away some particularly large shoes on the very bottom of the cubby shelf. Herein, Bob decided immediately, lay the impetus of a magnificent quip, which he would now, having been disarmed somewhat by the little gal's beauty, impose upon her with the most gentlemanly charm he'd been naturally endowed with. Hey, you know what they say about a man's feet, don't you, honey? The little gal glanced up at him with a slight look of disgust Bob figured were designed to hide her sexual interest. By the look of her, she had a couple of titties. That's not to say it were unusual to have a couple of them, but that they were titties worth noting. And note them he did. Over the left one, Bob's left, not hers, were embroidered her name in cartography. Amanda. Yes, I do, Amanda said. It means the bigger they are, the worse they smell. Bob gave her a cute little look he were fairly adept at. They do call me Bigfoot, you know. And I smell them from here, she said, flirtatiously spritzing a little right guard in his general direction. Amusing as it was to get the little gal all hot and bothered, Bob reminded himself this weren't the reason he came over here in the first place. He adjusted his bearing and declared, Honey, that smell you smell is the stench of injustice. There ain't a house ball in here that fits my special needs fingers, and being a vulnerable population as I am, that makes me feel awfully marginalized. I'm afraid I'll have to have a little word with your manager. The little gal just kind of stood there looking at him for a minute. Then she kind of exhaled and picked up the phone. Rod needs his shoes, she said. Bob stood there at the shoe counter watching Reverend warm up his little bitty pink ball while the guitar solo to girl school resonated through the woody timbers. He seemed to have trouble letting the ball go at the right time, and instead of rolling like it were supposed to, it sometimes just went up in the air and just kind of landed. That's what just happened now, and the ball were just kind of sitting there, not rolling one way or the t'other just waiting for some manner of physics to urge it this way or that. And it occurred to Bob that the ineffectuality of the Reverend might be pathological to some extent, because that's how everyone in his congregation happened to be too. If you asked any one of them who were presumed to be on their spiritual journey, they'd tell you, I don't know, or just fine, I suppose. And Bob had always found that fairly unconvincing. And maybe that were because Reverend just couldn't manage to roll any of them one way or the other. Reverend seemed a plain affront to Newtonian physics. Sir, or ma'am, if you prefer, makes no difference to us. Cooter County Ten Pin prides itself on inclusion and, well, what can it do for you? Bob turned to lay eyes on a man in a slightly more official-looking bowling shirt than the other employees' official-looking bowling shirts. Bob regarded him with righteous disdain. You must be Rodney Two Shoes, Bob said. Well, I'm here to tell you that your patriarchal bowling alley contains no more than zero balls with holes big enough to fit my particular fingers. And this has left me feeling marginalized and venerated because I was born this way, with big fingers, and big toes for that matter, and I found your establishment to be unaccommodating to my special neediness. Bob crossed his arms and waited for a response. Rodney Two-Shoes just kind of stood there studying him. Mentally handicapped is what you are, the girl behind the counter said. Now, now, Rodney admonished her. 
That is politically incorrect. He's handy capable. They said this last bit with a subtle hand gesture of correction. That's right, Bob said. I'm both handy and capable, as long as I've got big enough holes. So, what say ye? I demand justice. What gives, Bobby? Bob turned. It was Randy, come to see what the hubbub was about. This alley's an affront to my sense of social justice, Bob said. I'm simply voicing my concern. About what? About they ain't got no balls that fit me. Randy looked astonished at him for a moment, then took him aside by the shoulder. Bobby, this is my uncle's place. We can't be causing a goddamn uproar. I'll lose my discount. Can't you just... I've reached my breaking point, Mob said. I demand they either drill me a custom ball or... All right, you two, Rodney said. Just everyone settle down for a minute. He paused briefly, pursing his lips like he were real deep in consideration. Amanda leaned on the counter just considering her nails. Her right titties, from Bob's right, drifted after the counter, and it were clear it was contained in no brassiere at all. Mr. Bobby, I believe it was. I can't have nobody accusing this establishment of being intolerant, but I've got an idea I think might satisfy your demands. Follow me. Stretching to his full height, Bob gave Randy a nod as though to excuse himself. Amanda went back behind the counter. Don't cause no trouble, Bobby, Randy reminded him. Bob followed the manager down to the far end of the alley. Patrons looked on as they went, and it weren't lost on him how he were being regarded as a kind of diplomat. It pays to stand up for oneself, Bob figured, and already he were deciding in what other places he might showcase his vulnerability. The deli, maybe. The man his size were undoubtedly entitled to a little free baloney. Yes, sir. He were really onto something here. Bob followed the manager through a little administration-only door in the back of the alley. The room inside reminded him of one of the old storage containers he used to bid on. Just a big old mess. A who knew what all. This might take a minute, the manager said. I know, I've seen it in here somewhere. And he commenced digging through all the crap. What are you looking for? Bob asked. Wait, I got it. Two Shoes pulled out a big old bowling bag and handed it to Bob. No promises, but this one might just work for you. Bob opened the bag and stared in at an oddly colored ball he couldn't recognize the make of. They were dark green with a kind of swirly looking pattern on the cover. The pin suggested a wild offset probably spun like the Tasmanian devil once you put a hook on it. And then, he smelled it. A weird smell coming off of it, faintly reminiscent of dumpster juice on a warm day. Wincing, he turned to see all the finger holes. There were a star-shaped symbol between the finger holes. The name engraved on it read, The Destroyer. Try it on for size, said Two Shoes. Bob stuck his oversized thumb in the hole, and he'd be dipped if it didn't just slide right in with the slightest fart of dumpster-scented air. In went the fingers, and they closed over the tips like two little sphincters. I'll be dipped in shit, Bob said. Fits me just perfect. You're the first person I've ever met could fit that ball, Two Shoes said. Bob withdrew his fingers from the hole and sniffed them. Then he brought the ball up to his face and sniffed the holes. It smells funny, he said, suddenly feeling a bit marginalized again. It's a curious thing, said Two Shoes. That's why we left it back here all these years. It ended up on the house rack one day. Like so many balls do when bowlers swap their own for another they like better. And people were picking the thing up and getting grossed out by it. So, they stuck it back here, and here it remained for, well, years now. Why does it stink so bad? Oh, it's a curious thing, said Two Shoes. But I'll tell you what, 
You go ahead and throw that ball a few frames, and if you like it, it's all yours. Consider it your very own custom ball. As long as you don't go tell nobody we're unaccommodating to the missing franchise, mind you. Bob lifted the ball out of the old bag and weighed it in his hand. Perfect as it fit him, it seemed a bit heavier than the other 16-pounders. Two-shoes seemed to pick up on his apprehension. Look, I can't say as it's a perfectly regulation ball, Two-shoes said. I don't know the make or model, no serial number or anything. But, if it works for you, it's all yours. Just don't go spreading any rumors, you hear? I'll give it a shot, Bob said. Reverend were poised at the threshold of the lane, straddle-legged as he preferred to stand, swinging the ball back and forth between his legs like a pink pendulous testicle. Two-handed, one pinky in the finger hole, the other in the thumb. Presumably, he were calibrating the optimal point of release, a process that repeated itself with every frame. Down lane, a group of four pins remained. The song on the juke spoke of Bob's triumphant return. Curled under one arm, the destroyer. Have a look at this, Randy. Bob set the ball on the return rails. Randy came to look at it. Get out. Found you one that fits? It's just perfect. Randy tried putting his fingers in the holes, but the span of them was too far to reach. Then he withdrew his hand and sniffed his fingers. The destroyer, huh? Why does it smell like that? Oh, it's a curious thing, Bob said. Reverend, having seized upon the right moment, let loose the pink ball. It hit the hickory with a loud clunk, and succession of three softer. Rolling down the lane at a snail's pace, seeming hardly to know what direction to go in, Bob and Randy watched in rapt stupidity. There were something strangely fascinating about the way Rev bowled, as though by the power of providence the ball made its way toward the pile of pins. When they finally did meet, it seemed a friendly encounter. The ball just kind of stopped there and leaned on one of them. They watched. With time, maybe some infinitesimal shift of the Earth's axis, one of the pins went ahead and tilted over. The others soon followed. Who? said Reverend, spinning on one foot and pumping his fist. Who indeed? The scoreboard registered Rev had indeed picked up the split. As it stood, Randy and Rev stood equal. Now... It were Bob's turn. Bob dried his hand on the fan while the pins reset. He picked up his new ball and composed it under his chin. It certainly were a peculiar smelling ball. Still, a kind of focused assuredness came over him. A sense of the ball being right at home in his hands. Like Bob were its rightful owner after all. He seemed to have pulled it from the alley like a sword from stone. The sweep bar went up, and Bob made his approach. He pointed his left toe down the center of the lane and let her rip. The ball sailed out to the very edge of the lane before it sunk its teeth in, spinning faster and faster as it went. Then in it came, spraying pins all over the place like he dropped an M80 right in the middle of them. A perfect strike, beyond all reproach. Well, I'll be dipped in shit, Bob said. Damn, Bobby, said Randy. That's luck to have powderized the damn things. Beginner's luck, Bob said. Beginner's ass, said Rev. You're a natural. The ball rolled out of the ball return with a waft of stink and grease. Bob regarded it like a decorated soldier, just returned from battle. I will be dipped, he said. I'm an athlete. By Bob's next turn, Randy and Rev stood dead even at 19, both having missed the spare. Bob, sitting on his previous strike, stared down the lane and tried visualizing a reenactment. He sunk his fingers into the ball and lined up the shot. Here goes nothing. He made his approach and let the ball go, maybe a little harder than last time. The angle was a bit different 
but it grabbed the lane in just the same spot and refused to go into the gutter. Just at the shore of the oil, it wound straight into the pins, right in the sweet spot. And it liked to have smashed them to bits. Two big X's materialized next to Bob's name. Who? Reverend cheered. And Bob figured that were as apt a word as anything. Because he couldn't think of a better one himself. Part 2 That were pretty much the size of it that night. A crowd had begun to gather by Bob's eighth frame, and some of them quit bowling themselves just to watch him. Most notable, a few good-looking ladies who cheered wildly after every strike, to which Bob would respond with his core little look he'd been practicing. He'd taken to applying a kind of extravagant follow-through to his swing, which he'd hold dramatically until all the pins came down. Yes, sir. Bob were having a rare evening indeed. Even Amanda, the gal with the titties from the shoe counter, couldn't resist the occasional peek. Bob sensed the good-looking ladies might have something to do with that. There twerned a suitable titty between the three of them. But damn, if they didn't serve to boost his standing. Titties were like bait fish, Bob realized. There weren't much meat on little ones, but if you hung them out on your line for a while, you might net yourself a sizable dinner. They bowled three games, Randy and Rev averaging in the mid-hundreds, and Bob going 230, 240, and finishing the evening with a staggering 275. It were damn near a perfect game. Add this to the fact Bob had never even held a ball properly before, and it were clear something strange were in the stars. Or that Bob were a professional bowler in the making, or this were the damned luckiest night of his life. If the latter were the case, he knew, then he damn well better ride it out before the luck went and wore off. Bob had drunk a conservative nine beers by now, and Randy and Rev weren't far behind him. Festivities continued in the arcade room, Bob lighting up the Frogger pinball machine like the 4th of July. The little alley cats, tiny, titted, and scantily clad, rubbing up on Bob as if they meant to leave their scent on him. One hopped her ass up on the glass display for a joke, and when she hopped off again, there remained a heart-shaped smear with a sideways kiss down the middle. Randy paced about, looking worried something would happen to upset his uncle. Reverend, drunker than Bob had ever seen him, watched the dirty girls with a kind of conspiratorial urgency. Bob stood back from the machine and drained his beer. How many people in here? He asked. He tried counting himself, but there appeared two or three of everybody. Seven? One of the girls said, pleased at how fast she could count. No, wait. Eight. Four pitchers should do it. Randy, go ahead and fetch four more pitchers of your finest schlitz. On me. The spectators replied with cheers of joy. Cheers, Bob thought could get pretty addicting. I've only got two hands, Randy said. So make two trips. See that? Reverend piped in. Bob here is a regular SAT test. By closing time, they drunk the four pitchers and four more. 275, everyone kept on saying, and a record center on the pinball machine to boot. All the while, Amanda casting curious glances from her post at the shoe counter. Who is this mysterious man with such prodigious bowling scores and irresistible appeal to women? With his bushy mustache and rugged overalls and extra chroma bones to boot. What is so special about those girls anyway? Didn't he notice my larger than usual titties? Did I miss my chance? Yes, I did, Bob thought. And no, no, you didn't. Bob were so inebriated he nearly forgot to retrieve his new ball before they walked out the door. He did, in fact, forget to retrieve it, until some visceral sensation snapped him back to his senses. The Destroyer. How could he forget? 
It relocked King Arthur, leaving behind Excalibur. He put the smelly ball back in its bag and hurried to join Randy, Rev, and the ladies at the door. On the way out, he saw the flyer posted on the glass. League bowling beginning this Saturday. Minimum team three. Register by Friday to be eligible for prizes. The three men looked at each other. Before tonight, it would have been laughable. But with the ball, the destroyer, it seemed feasible. With the ball, everything were different. With the ball, Bob were like a god darn secret weapon. I will be dipped, Bob said. Part 3 So this fella comes in the store the other day, goes walking up and down the aisles, looks like he were just browsing round. I says to him, Mister, anything I can help you find? He goes, Eh, uh, I'm just browsing round. A certain tension typically espoused the group while they donned their shoes and various bowling accoutrements. But today, it were all different, because today, they were a team. Maybe not the most glorious team, Bob supposed, being that Rev and Randy couldn't bowl their way out of a paper bag. But Bob, since he's gotten his hands on the Destroyer, could strictly hit the pins. Even if the ball were doing most of the work, Bob were the only one who could pick it up. So it were only right he should get the credit for it. Rev and Randy were here to make it three players, but Bob, old Bob, were here to put up the numbers. So this fella, he's just walking around browsing, and he come to the shelf I got with cans of this and that and potted meat and whatever else, and just on top of that shelf is this old jaw of gefilte fish, been up there for God knows how long, and he goes to me and said, hey, What's that up there? And I says to him, Well, that's an old jar of gefilte fish. And he says, Well, what'll you take for it? And I says, Mister, that gefilte fish is most certainly expired. And he goes, Well, of course it is. I don't see it swimming around in there. So I says, That's not what I mean. I mean that the filthy fish has been up there since time immemorial, and if you were to venture and eat it, I fear you may end up expired yourself. What the hell's a filthy fish? Asked Randy, tearing and reapplying the Velcro on his bowling glove. It looked less to Bob like a bowling glove than a giant biometronic lobster. These little fishies look like Dr. Shoal inserts. Meanwhile, this fella tells me, says he knowed this Norwegian fella. Fella told him he used to eat rotten shark's heads. Used to dig a hole and bury a shark head in there. He come back a month later and dig it back up. And him and his friends just have at it. Where well, I'll be dipped, Bob said. I never did trust a Norwegian, Randy said. Turns out that's some sort of delicacy where he come from, Rev went on. So I says to him, Mister, if what you say is the truth, I don't figure that jar of filthy fish will be quite as fatal to your type as I initially figured. So I'll tell you what, I will let you have it there for twenty dollars. Twenty dollars, said Bob. That's highway robbery. It is an antique, Rev said. Sides, son of a bitch took it right off of me. Not a complaint. Man, I wouldn't buy a jar of anything for twenty dollars, let alone a filthy fish. Bob remembered the jar baby he'd discovered in a storage unit some years earlier. He'd have paid twenty bucks for a jar like that. But with the trailer fire, having incinerated Gertie Sue, her boyfriend, and everything else in it, they just as soon get remarried as have the jar baby back. That's to say, it were never going to happen. At least you found my lucky ball. Just goes to show, added Reverend, you don't always know the value of what you've got. 
I sure know that, Bob said. You see that, Randy? Bob knowed it. With a squeal and a booming hillbilly fanfare, the PA system commenced the tournament. Playing at lane 10, the destroyers, Bob, Randy, and Reverend. Randy tore the Velcro on his glove and refastened it a final time. He blew on his fingers and selected his ball and lined up for the first throw of the evening. Intermittently through the alley played the sound the sport were named for. The howl of Hickory Hardwood. Pins crashed. Hands slapped. Reverend tilted in his seat and ripped a jubilant fart. Go get him, Randy! Randy left one pin the first throw, but picked up the spare. Reverend, following a ponderous approach and even more ponderous roll, barely made it to the first pin. Still, the resultant domino effect knocked down all but one, and by the luck of the Irish, or whatever he was, he picked up the spare as well. Bob sunk his fingers into the freshly polished destroyer. A wave of energy seemed to flow up his arm and into his body. His right nipple became electric and stood turgid and insistent, pointing his way down the lane. He held the ball to rest against his mustache, the smell of alley grease and sulfur and melting rodent carcasses. With his left hand, he nervously tweaked the aforementioned nipple. Was that last run a fluke, or did Bob really have it in him? Get him, Bobby. Destroy them, some bitches. Bob made his approach, cocked his wrist, let the ball swing back, and let her fly. The destroyer hit the lane like it had been shot out of a rifled barrel. By the time it hit the pocket, not one of the pins stood a chance. The crash was so loud, three teams in every direction had to turn their heads. He done it again, said Rev. The goddamn destroyer! Twelve teams bowled three games each. By halfway through the last, the destroyers were firmly in first place. Girls had gathered, this time in greater numbers. Good titties among them. Bob were working on a sixth strike. He lifted the pitcher of beer and drained half of it to great adulation. Squalls of approval from the overexcited women. One lifted her t-shirt producing four undulating titties. Bob squinted his eyes to reconsider the titties, then found there were actually only two where he'd previously seen four. Bob were drunker than shit. But hell, he thought, it weren't no scratch on his supreme athleticism. The girl with the titties gestured to Bob then, a gesture that suggested her willingness to contribute to Bob's amenities. I'll be dipped, Bob said. Go get him, Bobby. Y'all see Bobby? That's my buddy. Bob lined up the shot and put down every pin. In the end, he bowled a 284, followed by two perfect 300s. By the time the trophy was supposed to be awarded, Bob had been swept into the utility room by a horde of questionable women. Titties innumerable, they swarmed about him like crazed honeybees. A soft voice whispered such profanities into his ear he nearly stopped and asked her to repeat herself. But before he could get to that, the hooks and eyes of his overall straps were dispossessed of each other. Likewise were his backside and boxer shorts as the press-on nails raked eagerly down his back. Someone knocked over a mop bucket and the pine-scented aroma of cleaning fluid filled the room. Bob imagined he were in an enchanted forest filled with magical sex fairies, grabbing and groping and just being unusually friendly to him. It occurred to Bob, in a detached, somewhat ethereal sort of way, that maybe he weren't quite as disenfranchised as he previously suspected. I will be dipped, Bob said. I'm a celebrity. The remainder of the destroyers, having taken pictures with their new bowling trophy, were at the bar drinking strange shots prescribed by the besotted runners-up. Drinks with names like Rusty Nipple, Shark's Ass, and Dirty Yardbark. Randy was too drunk to remove his bowling glove, so he just left it on. 
Reverend sat with his back to the bar and entertained the bowlers from his catalog of ten-pin lore. He were a fine bowler, Dale Hormel. Like to take a drink was all, but not like you and me. He would take a drink and get some peculiar ideas. So Dale's had a few after closing one night, and he's feeling a little peckish. So he goes in the snack bar and starts heating up the big pot of dippy cheese. Yeah, you know, the orange cheese for the nachos. Hard as plaster at room temperature, so he has a couple more while he's waiting for it to melt. And I guess he leans down in the pot to see how it's coming along. Well, it's anyone's guess what happened after that. They find him on the floor the next morning with the pot stuck on his head. Took two guys from the fire department to yank it off of him. And when the dead, there he was, with his head encapsulated in orange cheese, said Acme backwards on it. Nah, no one can hold their breath that long, buddy. He were deader than shit. But forget Dale, look who's come back! The Destroyer himself! Approaching on legs like wet spaghetti, Bob made his way toward the bar. The Destroyers reunited. Manager leaves at ten, said Randy. But Uncle Theo says we can stay after hours as long as we lock up. Praise the Lord, said Reverend. Bob beheld his teammates, these men of lower stock. Could barely bowl a game between the two of them. He wondered for a moment, were these two bums befitting of a bowler of his caliber? What say we see how drunk we can bowl, Bobby? I'll bet good money you can still throw strikes three sheets to the wind. I'll bet he can too, Randy agreed. Shit, said Bob. Maybe they were losers, Randy and Rev. But at least they had a winning attitude. Part 4 The Destroyer's After Hours... The alley in blue and red neon, the lanes cast in a sanguine smear. On the jukebox by the Winston machine, Rat told a tale much like Bob's own. A new kid in town, materialized from the Appalachians, greater than the sum of all what created him, endowed with such attributes as to be considered superhuman. Yes, sir. Bob were the benchmark of all men. Get it, Bobby. Right down the middle. Bob, having drunk four more pitchers by now, composed the frozen chicken under his chin. The pins, no more than an amorphous blob, wobbled at the end of the lane. Or was he himself wobbling? I'll be... <clears throat> dipped, Bob said. Do it to it, Bobby. Cheese him! Randy had passed out by the fourth frame, kneeling by the ball return with his face resting over the hand fan. A perpetual string of drool danced there in the breeze. By the color scheme of his jeans, it appeared he had peed himself a bit. Here goes nothing, Bob said. Bob hooked his thumb in either the chicken's ass or neck hole. He wasn't exactly sure which was which, and stumbled to the foul line and let loose. Chicken went spinning, hit the lane with wings akimbo. He done it! He strictly let her fly! The chicken weren't the most circular projectile, Bob reckoned, but on account of its heritage were fairly aerodynamic. It were a plump one furthermore, and then refused to fit in the gutter. Instead, it bounced off the bumper and turned ass first into the pins and Bob be dipped if every damn one of them didn't go down twice. In went the chicken, and down went the pins. A God's honest chicken strike. Bob raised his arms in triumph. Reverend sprung to his feet. The drunken girls squealed like drunken girls. Randy just leaned there, drooling. The whole scene were a spectacle of frenzied mayhem. Bob turned to bow for the spectators. Already, he was learning how to handle his celebrity status rather gracefully. You're the best, Bobby, shouted one of the girls. 
She were jumping up and down, and her titties were all over the place. Beginner's luck, Bob offered with great modesty. I'm just a regular old guy. Beginner's asshole, Bob Mason. You're the goddamn destroyer! From somewhere outside the alley just then came a long shriek and a loud crash. Loud enough, in fact, to shake Randy immediately out of his Schlitz coma. Everyone turned to face the door. What in the goddamn, Randy said, stumbling to his feet. I think someone had an accident, said Bob. Well, shit, said Rev. Let's get out there and have a look. Bob, you know mouth to mouth, ain't you? Bob brushed his nipple with anxiety. He couldn't say if he did or he didn't. Looked easy enough, but he sure as hell didn't want to do it. The whole group assembled in the parking lot, a solemn sobriety having eclipsed the drunken tomfoolery. The scene beyond the shoulder was perfectly unthinkable. You couldn't have arranged it to greater effect for the most savage of slasher films. I'll be goddamn dipped. A little coop completely upside down, its inhabitant having been shot from the windshield and bisected on a street sign, trailing vittles and who knew what to his final resting place down the road. The destroyers, ever valorous, vaulted the parapets and made their way out to the wreck while the girls watched with their hands over their mouths. They slowed as they approached. Where the lower half of the man was remained to be seen but the unfastened half lay prone on the pavement, an ever-expanding pool of dark in the darkness of night. I don't think he's gonna make it, Reverend said. He looked over at Bob. You said you know mouth to mouth, right? I think it's worth a shot to try it. Bob examined the body a little closer. It seemed to have been divested of most of its insides, maybe just about all of them. Now, Bob weren't no existition, but he were fairly sure most of those insides were plumb prerequisites to go on existing, not to mention the lack altogether of the other half of his body. Nah, Bob figured. Mouth to mouth on this poor fellow were a losing proposition. Anyone who'd ever inflated an inner tube knew you were wasting your breath if the thing had holes. And this son bitch didn't have a solid tube left in him. Rev must have sensed what Bob was thinking, and he took his hat off and held it to his chest. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. This poor some bitch is purely hollowed out herself, Randy said. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Aw, oh, hell, Bob said. He got on his knees in front of the bisected body and tilted the thing's head back and commenced to breathe into his mouth. The air came out in farts from some severed tube hanging out of its torso. Bob backed off and stood, wiped his sleeve across his mouth, a mournful look on everyone's face. I don't think he's gonna make it, Bob said. I reckon not. Hey, looky here, Randy said. He'd gone around the wrecked car and was rolling back a spherical object with his foot. Bob stood to have a look at it. A man's head popped clean off like a dandelion. Not a drop of blood left in it. Well, hell, Randy, Rev said. That is no way to treat a poor fella's head, especially after it's been popped off like that. Well, I don't want to touch it, though. Well, shit. Rev went to pick the poor fella's head up off the road, but when he got to it, he paused. He appeared not to want to touch it either. Man... Is it about heads, Bobby? They're, they're never all that objectionable when they're attached to whoever, but the minute they come off, they are downright distasteful. Oh, I think I found another one, one of the girls called from a ways down the street. But when Bob arrived to investigate, it weren't a head he found laying there by the giant skid mark in the road. It was a bowling ball. His bowling ball. Well, I'll be dipped. How the hell this end up out here? Bob bent over and picked it up. It felt warm in the crook of his arm. And curiously, there were a soft reddish light emanating from the finger holes. 
Might just have been some optimal delusion or something, but for a moment, he could have sworn he'd seen just that. How'd that get out here? Rav asked. Well, I suppose it must have rolled out here. Rev appeared to consider that a moment, and then nodded. That's mostly how balls get anywhere, ain't it? Sure is curious, though. It is a curious thing, Bob said. You've been listening to The Destroyer, Part 1, by Jeff Sturdivant. For Part 2 and the thrilling conclusion, tune in again next week for The Destroyer. Um, Part 2. And yeah, Jar Baby, Season 2, Episode 3. If you like this, you'll like that. Check it out. I'd like to personally thank you for joining me for this episode of Horror Hill. Don't forget to tune in again next week, when I yet again regale you with a handful of tales to terrify, plumb from the most depraved depths of the human imagination. The Destroyer was written by and brought to you courtesy of Jeff Sturdivant. Jeff Sturdivant is a winner of the 2018 ABR Listener's Choice Award for Best Humor Entry for his audiobook production of Occupational Hazards, The Blue Collar Omnibus. He writes about the absurd, the macabre, and general strangeness of the human experience. When he isn't writing, he drives a brown truck and delivers packages, possibly even to your house. When he isn't doing that, he's usually getting into trouble. If you see him, avoid him, but buy his books, because they're really quite good. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to me. If you'd like to hear more lengthy tales, be sure to take a look at my audiobooks available now on audible.com. Check out the link in the show notes for my ever-growing library of audiobooks. If you'd like to hear a premium ad-free edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillingtalesfordarknights.com where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive, dating back to 2012, including past episodes of this program, all of our other shows, and hundreds of standalone releases, all of them ad-free and available to download or stream. Thank you so much for your time and for giving our sponsors a try today. When you support our sponsors, you help support this show, and that means a lot to me. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You'll find me personally on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as well. Until next week, listener, when we meet up once again atop the Horror Hill for yet another Dance with Darkness. I bid you good night, sleep tight, listener, and whatever you do, if you hear scratching at your door, don't open it. <laughs> the darkness may have found you, but it's up to you to let it in. <laughs> Thanks for listening. You've been listening to the Horror Hill Podcast, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Jason Hill. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Felipe Ojeda, 
Luke Hodgkinson, and Jesse Cornett. Final mixing and mastering by executive producer and director Craig Groshak. The program's artwork by yours truly, Jason Hill. Logo by Craig Groshak. Got a terrifying tale of your own that you like performed? I take submissions. Email it to us today at submissions at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your work considered for production in a future episode of this show. That's submissions at simplyscarypodcast.com. If you enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on social media to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and our other programs. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for Chilling Tales for Dark Nights as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every week. And don't forget to hit the thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. If darkness is what you're after, listener, your search is over. Yet, let it be known, you haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. (laughs) 